of Australian weather and what records say is happening from the sea to the snow. Have you noticed anything odd round your place lately? A fish you've never caught before. Unusual events. Weird weather. Well, I've certainly noticed something odd round my home. I bought this place 12 years ago and in that whole time it never flooded. Nor in the 20 years the old guy had it before me. In the last two years, it's flooded 10 times. I've pretty much stopped mopping. And like many of us as I survey the damage, I wonder if this is climate change, a rogue La Nina, or just a really rainy year. Has the weather changed in the last 100 years or not? So I'm heading on an investigation that's all about the simple facts. Real tidal gauges, actual temperature records. And this will be a proper weather report, going round Australia to the places you and I live and play. It's time to take the temperature of Australia. And when it comes to weather, there's one organisation perfectly placed to guide me. They formed a hundred years ago. They are the Bureau of Meteorology. Hello, Carl. How's it okay. going, Johnny Kirk? Good, and uh, so you're going to run us through uh, a national 100-year Australia health check slash weather report. <laughs> That's right. Today we're going to do a national roundup of Australia's temperature, hydration and its circulation. Fantastic. So I reckon we start straight away with temperature, which means I'm heading here. I don't want to start with the heat, but with the cold. Is it as cold as it used to be? And where better to view the cold than from our nation's frosty tips? Our enchanted, legendary snowy mountains. Where I love to ski. You may think me elitist, but I prefer to think it's the genetic imperative of my Norwegian ancestry. And those Nordic genes of mine have a keen interest in what's happened to the snow. Well, this is 1964, the biggest dump on record. You look at photos like this and you think things must have changed, but have they really? Is it anecdotal or real? To find out, you have to go to the records. We're off to Spencer's Creek, where the Snowy Hydro Scheme has been taking snow depth measures every week since 1954. Dr Ken Green has been monitoring the snow for decades. We've got 65 inches, which... Inches? Yes, inches. It's been done since 1954, so they're not <laughs> going to change their methods now. This is about 162 centimetres. Snow cover swings wildly from year to year, so the best way to see the signal in the record is to compress it into five-year average trends. So how are we going to do the trend line? Well, I could put this in as the trend line. Hmm. In 60 years, we've lost a third of our total snow cover. But there is some rough comfort for my skiing aspirations, and that is that the beginning of the season hasn't really changed. So basically, since 1954, snow depth in July is much the same. When you reach September, it starts to drop off, so that by October, it's noticeably less. Essentially, spring is coming earlier. It's even clearer when you look at the records for the thaw, now two weeks earlier than in the 60s. And the snow line appears to have lately moved up from 1,500 metres to 1,600 metres. This actually used to be a ski run coming down here across the road and uh, now you wouldn't even dream of us. So what has happened to Australia's cold? Right, our first national roundup. So we're looking at minimum temperatures. And Carl, basically this is how cold it gets at night. That's correct, Jonica. If we start at the snowy here, we've warmed by about 1.1 degrees since a century ago. And that's similar to Perth, Sydney. If we're looking over here at Cairns, it's almost two degrees since 1910. 
Two degrees, so hot nights. Well, hotter nights than they used to have, yeah, on average. <laughs> and how do we know this to be true? Well, because frankly, the data collection behind it is mind-boggling. This is the Victorian regional headquarters of the Bureau of Meteorology. So how many things are kind of feeding into all of this? Um, too much really for the brain to comprehend, to be honest. And that's why we have a lot of alerts that help us. There are nearly 800 weather stations across Australia, with over 500 now fully automated. Of these, 112 sites have information that historically goes back far enough and is accurate enough to count as blue chip and be used as part of the 100-year record. OK, so to be in the top 100, you have to have a few things going for you. First of all, quality instruments. So this is a fully automated platinum temperature probe. Second, you have to have reliable records. So these platinum records go back to 2001, and then this old-fashioned but still accurate mercury goes back to 1910. Third, the station has to be well away from urban heat islands, so not in a big city. All this data is then fed by cables to central stations at the National Bureau headquarters in Melbourne, where it ends up here. I'm on the secret level of the Bureau now. This is the lair of the weather supercomputers. They have their own full-time staff of 22 IT slaves on 24-hour call, making sure nothing upsets them. A gazillion cable feeds are swallowed here, digested, and then spat over there. This temperature-controlled block of pampered bits and bytes contains all the records. This, essentially, is the history of Australia's weather. And this is how the Bureau knows how much minimum temperatures have gone up in 100 years. So that's nighttime minimums, but I bet what most of you are more interested in is what's happened to daytime maximums. And for that, I'm heading here. This is another one of my favourite spots in Australia. Sassy, sexy St Kilda, Melbourne. I lived here in my 20s and coming from Sydney and Perth, can I say Melbourne had a bit of a reputation for its weather. So when I moved here, I bought a coat, a scarf, gloves and these. But what no one told me was how darn hot it was going to get. And I'm not the only one shedding her coat early. Butterflies are really temperature sensitive. Melbourne's common brown butterfly now emerges from its chrysalis nearly two weeks earlier than in 1940. So how much hotter has Melbourne got? OK, Doctor, our national roundup of maximum temperatures. So what do we have? You can see here, Sydney through to Melbourne, Canberra, Hobart, they've warmed up by about 0.7 of a degree, and then some capitals a lot less, Adelaide 0.3. But if you go over to the west, Perth, and into the centre, Alice Springs, you've got 1.1 to almost 2 degrees of warming. Wow. In 100 years, the centre has heated up more than the coast. So the further inland you are in Australia, the more the maximum temperatures will have gone up? As a general trend, yeah. Overall, averaging maximum and minimums, our nation's core temperature has gone up 0.9 of a degree. But in 2009, Victoria's temperature spiked in a lethal fever. In Melbourne, we saw the previous February record broken by more than three degrees. Melbourne hit 46.5 degrees. Hopetown hit 48.8. We broke the Victorian record by 1.6 degrees. And, you know, these are records going back over 50 years. You know, you're not breaking them by, by you know, a few tenths of a degree. You're breaking them by whole degrees or more. And you know what happened next. Of course, it became known as Black Saturday. 173 people died in those fires, but they weren't the only casualties of this extreme heat event. When health researchers went back over the mortality records, it turned out an extra 370 people died during that week than you'd expect. Essentially, it means that they were tipped over the edge by heat stress. 
There's a rather confronting in-house term that's used for this. They call it premature harvesting. And it isn't just humans feeling the heat. One day, on a country golf course way down south in WA, it started raining black cockatoos. It certainly surprised the locals, let alone the birds. The year was 2010, and the temperature hit 48 degrees. An entire flock of endangered Carnaby's cockatoos literally cooked where they roosted. And can you see what these are? Budgerigars. Budgerigars that fell from the sky during another WA heatwave in 2009. All right, so this next diagnostic is a measure of extremes. It is. And what we've seen is more and more stations are breaking extreme heat in the last 100 years and less are breaking extreme cold. In fact, in the last 10 years, the number of stations breaking extreme heat records has doubled those breaking extreme cold. So frosty nights are becoming less common, mm. but extreme heat days are becoming more common. Now, some of my friends like to joke that if things go really pear-shaped, we can always move to Tassie. Well, one company already has. It's a company that makes something dear to many of our hearts. Alcohol. I love the smell of baby wine growing in the morning. <laughs> Two years ago, a famously Victorian company bought up big here in Tasmania, and they did so specifically to future-proof themselves against temperature. They are the family dynasty Brown Brothers, though I seem to have found myself a Brown sister. So had you actually noticed some damage to your bottom line, basically, due to temperatures? Yeah, um, we, well, we put up with uh, 10 years of drought yeah. um, and also um, one of our vineyards in Victoria where we grow our top quality sparkling wines, we got the warmer weather earlier and the bud burst had already come through, so the frost came in and actually killed all the shoots. That wiped out a whole vintage. The wine industry's detailed records show grapes in Australia's south are ripening on average 20 days earlier than in 1985. Talking to our scientists, the winemakers, the viticulturalists, um, they really pretty much turned to the board and said, we have to find this cooler climate property because within decades, we could see a two degrees uh, temperature rise in our current vineyards in Victoria. So they pretty much told us that if we continued to want to do what we do best, make quality wine, we had to come south. And now I'd like to demonstrate a little game of chance. So the chance of one month being above average temperature is one in two. The chance of the next month also being above average temperature is one in four. The chance of the next month also being above average temperature is one in eight. So what do you think are the chances of having 330 months in a row of above average temperatures? Because since February 1985, we have had 330 months in a row of above average temperatures. It's really extraordinary. If it was just by random chance alone, yeah. then there's only a one in 100,000 chance that that would have happened in the absence of human influence. So this bottle of red represents the chance that that run of temperature increase was caused by natural variability, sunspots or volcanoes. That's right. Right. <clears throat> I think we should drink it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's temperature. Next up, I want to check on Australia's state of circulation. I mean, that stuff we're girt by, the sea. I'm still in Tassie because something odd has been happening in these waters. Strange sightings, mysterious beasties were never before seen. I'm talking fish, and where there's fish, there's a fishing story. It was about two years ago, and I can remember it vividly. I saw a small group of fish come towards us. I said to my son, wheel in your rod as fast as you possibly can. And suddenly, bang, it just took off. And the reel itself was actually screaming. And my son didn't know what to do. And he said, Dad, Dad, what do I do? What do I do? I said, nothing, son. Just hang on to the reel and wait for the fish to, to slow down. So that's what we did. It took us about 40 minutes, I suppose. 40 minutes? 40 minutes, because the fish weighed more than the line capacity. Brand spanking new to Tasmania, it was a yellow-tailed kingfish. A real yellow letter day. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's exciting times for Tasmanian fishermen. With so many new fish arriving, they've teamed up with scientists to plot them. They've seen leatherjacks, green turtles, dusty mawong. It's actually really good news for Tasmanian fishermen because all the New South Wales fish are moving south into our waters. All in all, scientists have confirmed 45 new species have, like Brown Brothers, shipped on down to Tassie. Well, obviously, if fish from the Big Island are moving down, the water here must have got warmer. How much warmer? It's not too bad. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> All right, Dr. Carl, National Roundup time again. 100-year health check, circulation. Sure, well, what we're going to look at now, Johnny, here is the sea surface temperatures around Australia. And what we've seen is about a degree of warming over the last century. But you can see over the east coast, we have more warming than we do over the west coast. There's some hot spots as well, and that's off the coast of Victoria, Tasmania. Sea temperatures here off Tasmania have risen an astounding 2.28 degrees. That's about four times the global ocean average. And we think that's got something to do with changes in the East Australian current, but we're not exactly sure why. And last year, West Australia's blood began to boil. Time to visit my childhood home. I am a Cottesloe girl, which means I grew up not noticing how wide the verges are. You can fit a whole Sydney house on this verge dodging sharks on my local beach. And over there is Rotnest, Perth's playground. I think I've swum in just about every rock pool around here. And look, the water was lovely and warm. But what I'm about to tell you shocks me. Last year, on February 28, the water in here hit 26.4 degrees. 26.4 degrees, that's ridiculous. It killed the coral. Has that ever happened here at Rodnes? Not that we're aware of, not in uh, 40 metres of water. In fact, it was part of the biggest heat wave to hit Australia's waters ever. It began just north of Ningaloo Reef, hitting it heartbreakingly with the force of a pot of boiling oil. Some places up to 80% of what was there before is now no longer there. Really just gone, dead. Gone, That's dead, it. yeah, covered in algae. It travelled 1,200 kilometres south, reaching all the way to the southernmost tip of WA. Apparently, whale sharks were seen off Albany. Is that right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> whale sharks. Do you know how far South Albany is? That is not whale shark country. That is white shark country. <laughs> <laughs> not that it's a laughing matter for the whale sharks. They're effectively outrunning the hot water mm. in search of cooler water and bait and feed to actually sustain them through that period. The whole event lasted five months. It's our most extreme hot water event on record. So there's actually something significant we should know about these rises that we've seen in sea temperature. Yeah, absolutely. Changes in ocean temperature around Australia really impact on the type of weather we receive. So the warmer the water? The warmer the water, generally the more rainfall that you'd expect. Well, still on our nation's circulation, what 100-year health check would be complete without blood pressure? I may be stretching the medical metaphor a little bit here, but I'm talking about sea level. This is the glorious old West Australian port town of Fremantle, and it's home to one of Australia's oldest continuous tide gauge records. So this is the original Fremantle Port's tidal gauge from 1897. Beautiful piece of machinery, isn't it? And this is the latest tidal gauge. And between them, what they chart is on average a 1.5 millimetre rise per year since 1900. Now, many of you may already be doing the math on what that amounts to over 110 years. But while you do that, I'm jumping back to the bottom of Australia to Tassie's infamous Port Arthur, where there's a fantastic old marking that will answer that question. In 1841, the local storekeeper put in a tide mark, the oldest scientific one in the country. OK, it's just down there. There's a little oh, right. horizontal line with an yeah. arrow pointing down towards it. When the original records were rediscovered just a decade ago, Dr John Hunter was able to work out what's happened. 
Okay, total sea level rise since 1841 yeah. is about 17 centimetres, and that's the length of that, uh, yep. that stick. If you compare that with uh, Fremantle, yep. on the other side of the country, about 17 centimetres again since 1897. 1897. Yep. Okay, so that, that is our 100-year record, really, for Australia. Well. Yep, yep. This is how much it's gone up. Yep. 17 centimetres. And this seemingly small rise has dramatically changed flooding. Last year, Port Arthur copped it like never before. Using the historic Australian records, John Hunter has been able to show just how much each 10 centimetre rise in sea level has contributed to events like this. So if you raise sea level by just 10 centimetres, yeah. you find you get a tripling of the number of flooding events. Tripling? And if you raise it by another 10 centimetres, it goes up by another factor of three. So that's a total of nine. So, so if we got nine times effectively the number of flooding events for structures at sea level than we did 100 years ago? Yes, that's right. I am surprised by that. It's a big change, yeah. Yeah. So these are our current blood pressure, aka sea level readings, how they're looking. Um, so what we're looking at here is basically from the satellite record from 1993 and we can see sea levels have risen everywhere. Um, red on this plot up the top of the continent is a lot of sea level rise and the blue parts down the bottom is where we've had rather less sea level rise. Sea level naturally goes up and down a lot from year to year, but we can see from the Fremantle record the trend line is relentless. Which brings us last but not least to the final round of our 100 year health check, assessing our nation's state of hydration. Well, lately, parts of Australia have been well hydrated. Over hydrated, in fact. My personal assessment is that it's barely stopped raining in the last two years. My cottage has sprung a leak. I'm thinking of calling it Newby Creek. Our dams around Sydney and Brisbane are full and there have been record-breaking floods in Brisbane, Victoria, New South Wales. But again, is it new? What do the trusty old rain gauges from the Bureau say? So now the last two years, rainfall have been quite extraordinary, haven't they? They have, they've been record-breaking. So over the last 24-month period, the two years, we've seen more rainfall in Australia for a 24-month period than we've ever seen in the historical record. And tell me, does this have something to do with the fact that the ocean and the air temperatures are higher? Normally when you get a La Nina mm. event, you'll get almost record rainfall in Australia. This time what we saw was record sea surface temperatures around Australia. And so we've got basically a perfect storm. We've got a La Nina event, we've got global warming going on in the oceans around Australia, and then we've got this record rainfall as well. But you'll see there's one part of Australia noticeably absent from this acute attack of fluid retention. It's my old stamping ground, the southwest of WA which is where I am now, down amongst the carry trees. Well, underneath them actually, inside glorious Jewel Cave. Okay, so this is what I came here to show you. You see this black line? That's actually a water line, the high water mark from the late 60s. This was once a lake, up to here. But ever since then, the water has just drained away. The last of the water disappeared by the year 2000. And it's the same sad story across the region. The caves of Margaret River have lost their lakes and streams. Land use changes have compounded the problem, but this is a symptom of chronic dehydration. So what we've got here is basically rainfall during April to November and in the last 15 years in particular in the southeast of the continent here is about a 10 to 20 percent reduction in that rainfall. That much, yeah. That's right. And over here in the west we've seen the same thing but that's actually occurred since about 1970. So they've had almost about four decades with much less winter rainfall than they used to have. And now the big summary. What has happened to our weather? Well, we're ready for the final report in Australia's 100-year health check. So, 
Hydration. Wetting up north in the tropics, um, longer term dehydration across the south, particularly in southwest WA. Okay. Circulation? Sea levels increasing all around Australia, um, not lapping at our toes yet. Finally, temperature. Temperatures around Australia have risen by about a degree. Um, less chills, more fevers, and some regional variation in that as well. So some regions are heating up more than others. Essentially, what the records show is that global warming isn't something that's coming. It's here, in our backyards already. It's pointless now to ask, is this climate change or natural variability? What we see is one acting on top of the other. So every parcel of air, every ocean current, every weather system is now about a degree warmer. And when you go through and do the physics, that's actually a hell of a lot of energy added to the climate system in general. You know, of all the things I learnt on this investigation, it was that comment from Carl that really struck me. It was like, aha, uh -huh, I finally get it. There's one degree of extra heat across the whole planet. That's just a lot of new energy in our weather system. What happens when you add another degree and another? So what will happen in the future? Well, I'm obviously going to have to spend some money on a retaining wall. And like the rest of us, I'll try to do my bit. But I'll continue to toast my sunset, pray to my snow gods, and get as much joy as I always have out of the parts of Australia I love. I do think I should do so with eyes wide open though, and not pretend there's no change to see. That's all from Catalyst for now, but remember you can find episodes and transcripts at our website. Thank you.